a playlist original. Welcome to the Pilot Podcast. Where we review the pilot episodes of TV shows to answer your question, should I watch this? My name is BJ. And my name is Mitu. And this week we're watching Clipped on Hulu, Queenie on Hulu, The Big Bakeover on CW, and Presumed Innocent on Apple TV+. So stay tuned to the end to find out BJ's favorite donut to make. Oh, I already know. Okay. All right. Before that, how about we jump into a story about basketball? You're talking about Clipped on Hulu. Based on the ESPN 30 for 30 series on the affairs of Donald Sterling, Ed O'Neill plays the former Clippers owner who was caught on tape asking his mistress V, played by Cleopatra Coleman, not to bring black people to games or be photographed with them. Coincidentally, coaching his team was black man Doc Rivers, played by Lawrence Fishburne. You know, right from the start, I have to say, it was hard watching Donald treat people so poorly. Not just the racism, but he also treats his team like possessions. Yes. I remember when this scandal happened, and I remember being a bit confused about how scandalized people were, because ultimately what he said on the recording, if I can remember correctly, was something to the effect of people will make fun of him, other rich white men will make fun of him if V allows herself to be photographed with black men or even Magic Johnson or bring them to games. I believe that was one of the things that she got in trouble for later. But what I hadn't considered in the original run of this story is that trickle down of that behavior to his staff. So it was so jarring to see a legend like Doc Rivers, who was so beautifully played by Lawrence Fishburne, really get jerked around to the point where, as you said, Donald Sterling kind of says, I own you to him. He straight up says that. Yeah. Yes. And I have to assume because this is based on 30 for 30 and they are investigative journalists over there that at least some of this is true. I assume it is dramatized. We have a really fantastic cast here. But obviously this is based on things that happened. This is inspired Mm -hmm. by events. And based on some of the quotes here, perhaps direct references to specific events. Yes. I don't have any evidence for this, but this feels like a case where it's not only based on a true story, but they're going to remain more faithful, at least to the reporting on this story. And it just makes the show that much more fascinating because I think of a legend like Doc Rivers, and then I think of that first scene that they have where Donald Sterling puts his hand in Doc Rivers' food and is like, oh, is that Havarti on your sandwich? Y'all, this is an audio medium. BJ just rolled his eyes very hard because it was so jarring to witness that kind of casual racism of putting his hand in that legend at that point, already a champion's food. It was so disgusting. And frankly, you do not have to be Doc Rivers. You could be me. You could be somebody who's never coached a basketball (laughs) team to a championship. You do not get to put your hand in my food yet. That's right. Because I could be like Whoopi Goldberg, Eddie. I might have my potential coming for me. But no matter what, you respect people. And it's clear he did not respect his coach. And then you see that trickle down into the players. We have Chris Paul played by J. Alphonse Nicholson and Blake Griffin played by Austin Scott. And they don't like each other. And they famously didn't like each other. But I did not think about how the behavior of the owner's office would trickle down into discord with the athletes. Yes, because we see... Throughout this episode, Donald cares more about his image and also the season ticket holders. He Mm -hmm. wants to make those people happy because that is where he's getting a lot of the money from. But it also means treating his staff and the players as spectacles who will entertain these season ticket holders to a degree that I don't think other teams do for their audience. (laughs) It was so jarring. You know, as someone who feels really passionately about Blake Griffin's thighs, (laughs) I just was really blown by that scene where Donald Sterling brings season ticket holders into the locker room as these guys are trying to debrief, 
and decompress from a game. And that season that they brought on Doc Rivers, when he coached for the Clippers, they broke records together. So this is a mm-hmm. tired team that is like they achieving. Were <laughs> they were working. They are achieving what they didn't think was possible. And then here come these season ticket holders all in their faces, poking and prodding at them. Post game press is hard enough. Mm-hmm. And then having to add that, it just must have been awful. So that was really jarring to witness. And the other angle I had never considered was that of his wife. I think I was so into the spectacle of V when this story first dropped in 2014 that I had not considered Donald Sterling's wife in this. And I thought her portrayal in the show was fascinating of, I know that you do this. Just don't embarrass me. Just stop embarrassing me. That's it. Yes, Jackie Weaver did a really great job of showing how conflicted she was, where she's accepting Donald's behavior, but she doesn't like it. She's venting to her girlfriends throughout the episode, and we see how she really has placed her identity on being this poised, perfected wife who can throw really good parties, who is managing the family, looking after the trust so that this money doesn't get stolen. Mm -hmm. And she's not getting that much respect from Donald, even though he is like, you're my wife. I guess you'll pretty much stay my wife for now. (laughs) It's wild. (laughs) Her name is on that court. We learned that. And she feels Mm -hmm. very strongly about that, understandably so. Mm -hmm. And then conversely with V, I think of her and that Barbara Walters interview, or I think of her Instagram, or all the wild things that she said and did during that time. But I hadn't considered another angle that they present on the show is she needed housing. LA is expensive. Mm -hmm. Get in a good school district. Get into a good school district. And so these are two people who entered a relationship, eyes wide open about what they both want and need. And I hadn't considered her needs outside of just the ridiculousness of the fame and the spectacle. And so I thought that was just such an interesting angle of the show. I, in my honesty circle, was not thrilled to watch this because I was like, I don't know that I want to watch another story about a racist thing that has happened, especially because the Donald Sterling thing to me was so long and buried. But... They just brought out so much interesting information, so many new and interesting perspectives, at least to me as someone who has not followed up on this story. And it is just so well acted. I mean, the Lawrence Fishburne of it all alone is fantastic. So what would you rate Clipped on Hulu? I feel so surprised in saying would watch again seriously. I was extremely tempted to keep watching. And the only reason I stopped watching this juicy soap opera is I did not want to accidentally bring elements of the second episode into this review because I know my memory would trip up and I'd be like, and then when V did this, and then you'd have to correct me. So I didn't want to back it up. (laughs) I didn't want to get caught breaking the rules. You are a rule follower through and through. (laughs) I would rate this would watch again casually. I did not keep up with this story when it first broke. So a lot of it is new to me. It is interesting to then look up these people and see their history, see like Doc Rivers' career. I was familiar with J.J. Reddick, but didn't realize how he played into this storyline as well. So that Mm -hmm. was cool. Um, So I think I would keep watching just to inform myself on some historical figures. (laughs) (laughs) All right, historian. Why don't you take us from a late in life crisis to a quarter life crisis? You're talking about Queenie on Hulu. In this series, based on the novel of the same name by Candace Cardi Williams, Queenie Jenkins is played by Dion Brown, and she's a 25-year-old Jamaican-British woman living in South London. And she is living between two cultures and trying to neatly fit into neither. So, <laughs> me too. what were your first impressions? When you and I were talking about this show before recording, I thought you used a perfect phrase of relatable tension. That's really what this is. It feels very much like a 25-year-old show. It felt like shrill to me or other shows where you're young, but you're not that young. You're on the precipice of needing to figure some things out. And it's messy. 
And so I thought that was very relatable on this show. And I think they did a good job of balancing humor with some of the sadness. Yes, Queenie is relatable, but she's going through a tough time. She does say she's going through a quarter life crisis. And we see her deal with racism and her own relationship with her boyfriend and his family. We see work struggles, which probably also deals with racism, where she is not being listened to by her boss and team. We see family tension. It seems that she is not on speaking terms with her mother, and the rest of her family wants them to reconnect. And she has this whole health issue, which relates to her relationship with her boyfriend, and she's not even telling her best friend about that. So it is relatable, but it's also hard to watch at times. It is difficult. And for me, what was also tough was I couldn't tell where she could turn to for help Mm -hmm. because she starts to open up to her aunt and then her aunt starts hitting her with some biblical guidance, some (laughs) astrological guidance. And she's like, can't have that. That's not the space I'm in right now. Her bestie, she was just keeping things light with her. It's clear she didn't want to burden her best friend. And then what's she going to do? Complain to her boyfriend who won't deal with racism in his own home about racism elsewhere in her life. And so it is sad that it appears that she has nowhere she can turn, or at least she's choosing not to open up to any of these people. So I think what was difficult for me also was how much of it she internalized. And we even Mm -hmm. witness that internalization through the narration where she keeps saying in her own head that we hear, tell him, tell him, tell her, tell her. And then she's like, ah, you know what? They're having a good day or ah, not. This is not the right time. And so she just keeps putting it off. Yeah. And that's where I feel conflicted because that is very relatable. Internalizing Mm -hmm. all of these issues, things she's going through. And I don't want to watch an entire episode of that. I would like her to have a breakthrough. I would like her to have a hint of finding someone to listen to her. It seemed like maybe her granddad would have been the one most comfortable talking to her, but we didn't see much of that. I was hoping she would have opened up to her friend who, I just have to say, had some great lines. Ivory King, Mayo Mister, Parchment (laughs) Paper Poppy. (laughs) Parchment Paper Poppy stopped me in my tracks. That was so funny. (laughs) And so I just wanted progress in this episode. I feel that. For me, I wouldn't even mind if it were really messy. Mm. For me, the issue was it didn't feel like it went deep enough. Mm -hmm. So we saw this overview of some setup, like you said, issues at work, at home, home defined a couple ways and within herself. And I think they would have benefited from perhaps focusing on one of those areas and going a little bit deeper, at least on one of them, because it felt a bit surface for me. It was very surface. They crammed in a lot of issues in her quarter life crisis. Mm -hmm. But in a 22, 24 minute show, you can't go in depth into all of those plot lines. Yes, and they could have even introduced all of them, but Mm -hmm. choose one to really hone in on. And I think they didn't do that. So despite that, are you interested in watching more episodes of Queenie on Hulu? I heard very good things about the book. I haven't read it. Mm -hmm. So I think I want to give it a couple more episodes. I'm not so impressed by this pilot, but I think if you are someone who is interested in these coming-of-age stories, perhaps you can join me in giving it a couple more chances. I think that's reasonable. I would give it another shot. I would watch it while folding laundry. It is a lot of tough topics that Queenie is going through, so I don't want to focus too hard on it. (laughs) But I am interested in the journey. Queenie is a likable character. That keeps me wanting to watch more. True. I root for her. So how about we go from quarter life crisis to donut business crisis? Many crises at the Pilot Pod (laughs) this week. You're talking about The Big Bake Over on CW, Season 5 British Bake Off winner and business boss Nancy Burtwistle is traveling America and turning around struggling bakeries. In this first episode, she discovers Boba as she helps a donut shop, Sugarbox, find its distinct selling point in a city filled with competition. 
So, Mitu, what did you think of our baker and owner Cindy and her family donut business? They picked the perfect first family for this. I was so motivated by Cindy. She was clearly so motivated, so personally and professionally motivated to do right by her business. She took it over from her parents. She feels a lot of pressure, which really just emanates off the screen <laughs> for how much she wants to do right by her parents' legacy. She also brings in the history of where she's from. Her family immigrated from Cambodia. There are tragedies in her family that lead to even more pressure that she feels. And then she's still like so bubbly and likable and her family is adorable, like her husband and her kid and the people that work at the shop. And so it was just a lovely family to see win. I agree. And what I really liked about Cindy and her whole family is that they do seem passionate about this business. We see Cindy being very creative with her donuts, wanting to make new flavors, decorations. It's not just, this is how my family makes money. It's not just, I'm continuing this because my parents started it. It seems that she genuinely likes the donut business. Yes, her mind is blown when Nancy suggests filling the donuts with boba. And then she takes it from there and gets really creative about how to dress them up further. And so it was nice to see that side of her in addition to the part of her that was just concerned about the business. And then it was nice to see Nancy's role as the restaurant rescue person, very wraparound services. She looked at that menu. Mm -hmm. She did some like demo research, which was cool. <laughs> she talked about target audiences. It was very like actual business taste 101. Testers. Yeah, she had taste testers. It felt like she had focus groups. Mm -hmm. And then she brought in the design team, the carpenter, Eric. She even noticed they needed certain new kitchen equipment. And she named, I don't know that she named particularly well, but they seem to like it. She named a new menu item. And so yes. I liked her as this vessel for having these restaurants do better. I agree. Nancy and Eric had good energy. They kind of matched that positive vibe we were getting from Cindy and her family. Yes. And I appreciated that Nancy was pretty honest. She was like, look, you got a lot of donuts that aren't doing well. Your social media wall's not that exciting. And I looked at a map. There are 10 other donut shops on this mm -hmm. block. So what are you going to do? <laughs> How are we going to step this up? And usually... On a lot of restaurant shows, that's where there's a pushback, where the restaurant mm -hmm. owner is like, no, actually, I serve the best blah, 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 this side mm -hmm. of the Mississippi River. And there was none of that. It was just two women earnestly working together to have the best outcome. And so the tension of the show was just wanting to see this shop succeed. There wasn't mm -hmm. additional needed drama. It was just frothy and light. But you see people working really hard and being really creative. Mm-hmm. What did you think of the final reveal of the shop's makeover? I thought they did a beautiful job adding more seating. Mm -hmm. I think the social media wall could have been further improved. Nancy mm -hmm. herself said that perhaps she's not the best person to think through what should be a social media wall. And I think she proved herself right. I think the social <laughs> media wall that they made is somewhat cute, but it doesn't seem functional. The structure was too big, so you could not selfie and see the donut seat that they made so if you took a selfie on it and this would only make sense if you watch the show so i'm sorry but you would only see the back of the seat so there's mm -hmm. no real distinct thing that t says that you're in a donut shop except for that very small sign that they put on the seat that says sugar box donuts i agree it didn't need to be a seat i think they should have leaned into social media wall yes and just decorated the wall and that would have been sufficient. I did really like the patio area. They made yes. that look nicer, brighter, because that is a unique feature that they could take advantage of, especially with boba drinks seeming to be one of their hottest items. Like, I imagine in California on a sunny day, sit outside, mm -hmm. have a cold drink. I thought that was very smart. And then adding the seating inside as well. I know mm -hmm. I already mentioned that, but it blew my mind that they had like three seats. And Nancy was like, we need at least 10 chairs in here. And as someone who likes to sit, one of my favorite activities, I felt strongly about that. 
So do you feel strongly about this show and want to watch more episodes of The Big Bake Over on CW? Yes, I hope they're all as lovely as this first episode. I would definitely watch this while cooking, where Mm. it's just the perfect accompaniment while I'm making a dish. And I'm just watching a group of people work hard together, be super positive, and achieve a collective goal. I agree. I will watch again seriously. I like that this is a lighthearted, feel-good, but also fun show. And the food looked yummy. Yes, I would try a bonut. I know it's not your favorite combo. I love boba tea. I love donuts. I'm not convinced of combining them, but if I find myself in L.A., I might try it. Either way, they'll have something on the menu for you. That's for sure. So why don't you take us from the donut shop to the courthouse? You're talking about Presumed Innocent on Apple TV+, Plus, based on the 1987 novel of the same name by Scott Turow. This legal thriller miniseries follows Rusty Savage, played by Jake Gyllenhaal. He's a prosecutor who has become the prime suspect in the murder of one of his colleagues. So, me too. you've seen a lot of legal thrillers, legal dramas. What did you think of this take on it? A very classic setup. You know, when I was a child, one of my favorite authors was John Grisham. <laughs> Absolutely normal childhood. <laughs> and so... This feels like a classic setup where we have what we are to believe is like this stand-up guy, prosecutor, which people can have their own thoughts, but stand-up guy, prosecutor, family man, but not all is what it seems. And now he might be a killer. And now people are thinking, well, maybe he was a little rude in line behind me at the coffee shop. Like you start seeing people develop suspicions about him Mm -hmm. and he starts being a less reliable person in this show. And so that felt very classic legal thriller setup. Yes, we've definitely seen this story in many ways before. So it's a bit cliche in that way. But I will say they present Rusty well. He starts out, seems like a great guy, and they slowly add on these complicated relationships he has with literally everyone around him and you're like okay rusty is suspicious he is at least hiding something with his wife with his therapist with his colleagues nobody seems to like him i must underscore (laughs) even the therapist seems to be like uh do we have to talk again next week like Mm -hmm. even his son i don't want to play baseball with you (laughs) his son his own kin it just seemed like everybody was like iffy on Rusty. And I want to specifically call out his wife, Barbara, played by Ruth Nega. I feel like Ruth Nega was not given necessarily a lot to do Mm -hmm. in this first episode, and yet I couldn't take my eyes off her in any scene that she was in. She's really good in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., so good to see her in a new show. Shout out to my Irish Ethiopian sister. I will say, I just remembered, Raymond, who starts the episode as the big boss played by Bill Camp, he seems to be favorable towards Rusty. Yeah. Just (laughs) at the beginning, I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but even he eventually is like... Huh? What? "Uh, Rusty? (laughs) Do you have anything you want to tell the class? Can you explain? (laughs) Can you? (laughs) Can you? And then the other part of this that feels extremely 1987... And I was curious if they would update this or not, is we have many an erotic thriller around that time, late 80s, early 90s. Often, if the victim was a woman or if a suspect was a woman, she was not particularly likable and she was often kind of slut shamed. And in this one, it feels like we're leaning toward that where it doesn't seem like anyone really likes our victim. A lot of people feel very passionately, but because... For Rusty, he seems to be kind of romanticizing her, and obviously he's trying to protect his career. We meet her ex-husband and her child. They seem to be navigating around how she has compartmentalized a lot of her life. So even her colleagues were, many were unaware that she had a child. And then when we think about her colleagues, they kind of paint her as like promiscuous as well as ambitious. 
And then, of course, we have Rusty's wife, who is not a fan of Carolyn. <laughs> and so no one seems to like Carolyn and everyone seems to be motivated, but personally motivated, not for her. Yeah, that was really odd to see Carolyn as the victim. People are sad that someone has died. And her case is notable because of her career status. But we don't see people like mourning her, grieving her, missing her. In fact, Rusty seems stressed out. (laughs) Yes. And the reason that they care about her case, in addition to her being high up, is the fact that we're at the point of an election for Mm -hmm. district attorney. And so it's politically motivated. They want to win in finding out who killed her because it would be high profile. Yes, it'll be high profile. And also this case stands out in this world because the murderer is mimicking another famous, I guess, serial killer or someone who at least murdered one person in a strange way that Carolyn was involved with. (laughs) So it's very juicy, but no one particularly cares about Carolyn herself. They just are all so curious, looky-loos, who want to know what happened. So how curious are you to watch more episodes of Presumed Innocent on Apple TV Plus? I think I would watch again casually because I am a legal thriller girl. But I am prepared as well to turn this show off if it continues to sort of she slept with too many men and that killed her its way through the plot, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So if we get more of that, I think I might have to bow out. There's only so much of that I can take. But if it is able to graduate from that, then I will continue watching because I'm a legal thriller girl and I am intrigued to know what happened. And if you are also a legal thriller girl, gender neutral, perhaps you might be interested in this as well. Interesting. You might have to keep me updated on the show. I would put this at a wood watch while folding laundry. I'm not that excited by this legal thriller. I don't think I care that much whether or not Rusty did it. It's well done, well acted, but I'm not that drawn into the mystery of this murder. Yes, very cliched. And so if you like stuff like that, it's another one for you to watch. But if it's not your thing, the legal mystery, perhaps this is not the one that brings you in. All right. So why don't you tell us what your favorite donut to make is? I don't make donuts often because I don't really deep fry things. Mm. And despite people saying you can bake or air fry donuts, it's not the same. They're liars. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Sorry. I don't know why I felt so strongly. I've never made a donut in my life. So sorry. Just felt like starting a fight. (laughs) <laughs> one that I have a recipe one that I have a recipe bookmarked for and I've had bookmarked for for a long time is for a creme brulee donut which mm. I've had at multiple donut shops and would like to make my own one day. Is it coated in a glaze that you can kind of crack like a creme brulee? Yes. You make the Ooh. donut, you fill it with the pastry cream, And then you dip it in the hot caramelized sugar to get that hard shell. That actually sounds very tasty. It's like creme brulee with a donut. I look forward to when you make that. One day, maybe. All right. Until then, where can people find more episodes of The Pilot Podcast? All you have to do is head to our website at thepilotpodcast.com, or you can follow us on all of your favorite podcast platforms. You can also follow us on social media, at the pilot pod on Instagram, TikTok, and X, and you can send thoughts, feelings, show recommendations because every other week we do a show recommended by you, our wonderful listeners, to ask the pilot podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs>